if your kid's being a bit silly and hitting things, like kicking the table, the parents will be like, don't hit table, Sam. And they'll treat like all the objects around you like there's some sort of god almost within it, or some sort of life force. Wow. Hello and welcome to the Abroad in Japan podcast. Probably the best way of learning about life in Japan without actually being in Japan. I'm your host, Chris Broad, and we're joined, as always, by England's top Japan enthusiast, Mr. Pete Donaldson himself. Pete, how the devil are you doing? What's going on over there? I'm good, Chris. I am going to be in a West End show very soon. Oh, wow. Uh, there is a podcast called The Football Ramble, What I Do. Uh, it's one of the I've oldest of and most popular uh, independent sports podcasts yeah, in the UK. I've never heard of this. And, uh, we, uh, and we are doing a show at London's Palladium. Nice. And I have been tasked by myself, let's make that very clear, with making... A papier mache head of some description. <laughs> I'm not going to go into what head it is, but I have made myself a little head. Um, and turns out papier mache takes fu- <laughs> lipping ages. Why does it take so long? I've never done it. Pa- yeah. It's just like layer upon layer upon layer of just constant gluey paper. Wait, and whose I, head is it? Uh, What's the, what's the story? I, 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 I won't get into it because no. the people who will come, it's a little surprise. But, um, yeah, I made a little papier-mâché head. Like, you remember, like, Frank Sidebottom from the 80s? A little bit like that, really. And, is uh, it some, so, have yeah, you done, I'm like, mid, a, a famous footballer? Is it, is it like, Ronaldinho or something? Maybe? Yeah, it's Ronaldinho. <laughs> <laughs> Out of all of the players, Ronaldinho. He'd be up for it. He'd be up for, he'd be up for popping in anyway. There was beers involved. Um, but, he, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, so I made this papier-mâché. It just, I, I thought papier-mâché was, like, yeah, it takes a couple of days and it's done. You got to put layer of if you want it to be durable, you got to put layer upon layer of wallpaper, paste covered Jesus. paper. Oh, lo- you know, like when you see in America, like they do those science experiments with mm. the chicken wire and the um and and, and the volcano. Um, not doing that with my kids. <laughs> <laughs> not doing that with my Ben. <laughs> oh man, it takes that ages. Da- sorry, love, <clears throat> not doing it. <laughs> Speaking of West End, should I ever tell you I I had a meeting about. It must have been a month or two back now about doing the mm. uh, abroad in Japan, the West End, like show. Yeah, a serious show. Which yes, I in, in the end I, I turned it down, but it got quite serious. Fool. And they, damn fool! When 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 I got contacted by them, I was like instantly I was like, no, this is the worst. Mm. This is not going to work, is it? Natsuki the musical. I want a cigarette and another cigarette and a third cigarette. My <laughs> breakfast. It just, it just actually it's quite good. I would watch that. But it was um it was going to be the the story of like how I moved to Japan. It was basically a book. They were going to turn the book into a screenplay and that mm. screenplay into a you know into a, a play. And I was just like, no, this is this is awful. How's no, it going to work? Don't, what's I don't what's want any of this? Yeah, yeah. And, but then I had the meeting, and they were a serious company that had done really impressive plays. Like it wasn't like mm. Barry and Steve from Chelmsford. It was like this is a proper, <laughs> like award-winning, very powerful, very you know prominent company that was pushing the idea. Yeah. Um, and I got close to saying yes at one point because the idea that I got really excited about was building um, these really elaborate and beautiful sets on stage, right? So they were gonna yeah. they were gonna replicate my apartment. Uh, the the abroad Japan the, what, the apartment where I lived for my first three years yeah. which isn't hard because it's one square foot in size <laughs> and then they were going to replicate uh, a, a Japanese classroom and an izakaya I used to go to so like there was going to be these mm. really cool sets and that nearly swung it for me because I was like I want to see this I want to see these sets realised yeah, yeah, yeah. and then I could get to they wanted me to like help choose the actors and pick them out and there was a lot of appeal but I also just thought this a lot could go wrong here and even in the hands of the experts, I don't, I don't know that the abroad Japan story can warrant such a such a play. You know. Well, I, th- I think like I remember you telling me this, and uh, I think you remember my advice at the time was, oh my god, just have loads of meetings about it and go as close as you can to signing contracts <laughs> because I need to know what this sounds like and looks like. Um, I-, I think it was it was a company that did the um, uh, Miyazaki uh, adapt adapt adaptations adaptations in in London, I think, and um, and I understand why they sort of went well. Okay, this guy's got a um, a best selling book in a genre that we understand. Japan, mm. um, we could, you know, we could bring this kind of best-selling book to to to, to life, and it would it would it would probably be quite good. But um, like a musical, 
I don't think it was going to be a musical. You. I thought it was a musical. Oh, no. It sounded like a musical to me. Well, anyway, well, um, I would. I and and you being involved <laughs> in like choosing the actors and stuff. It just sounds like a proper mad mad one. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. with the greatest respect, Chris. I mean, you're not, you're not a casting director. Well, well, well. I've cast whoa, Natsuki, whoa, whoa. Ryotaro, I've cast Natsuki, American Ryotaro. Pete. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know how it would have all. It would have been an interesting story at the very least. It wouldn't have been a musical because I hate musicals unless it's right. You know, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Count me out. I just hate how musicals rob you of the drama because he's like, right. you know, the characters like, oh, my family are dead. They're dead. They're dead. They all got hit by a truck. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I don't, to be fair, I really did enjoy the Book of Mormon. That was a that was a banger. That was really good. That's a solid yeah. musical. But um, Meatloaf one, like the Meatloaf one. That was mm. alright. I just don't <laughs> know what my main concern was. I'm not sure what the story beats are. You know, as somebody who's into yeah. screenwriting myself and whatnot and narrative structure, I was like, I don't know where the narrative structure would lie unless we made things up, like a. Uh, you know, had to make up like lots of lies. Like, oh, I remember that yeah. day at the school where it became like Die Hard, and the German terrorists turned up, and we had to, <laughs> just, you know, just make it all See up. See you in the prep room, Richter. <laughs> <laughs> now I have a machine gun. Ho ho ho! That was all good. Uh, no, I'm like, now I'm getting fired up about this idea. Actually, I know. Get get him on, get him on the blur. Get him on the pink phone. Take Give a, a step back from the Abroad in Japan book. I'm thinking Die Hard in a Japanese school, right? <laughs> Let's make it happen. Yeah. yeah. But dream on. Dream. You know, I said to uh, them, "Let's have another died. meeting. Let's have another chat in here, yeah. where my career is down in the dumps, and I need, I need a revival. I need something. I do think <laughs> it, it could work as a sort of comedy or something. The way I sold it to the, and I, I got so invested in the idea, I was like, "We'll make these sets. We'll serve sake, and the idea yeah. will be for the audience." it'll be like they're transported to Japan as best they can be, you know, sitting yeah. there, this immersive stage, beautifully crafted Japanese woodwork and stuff, Japanese snacks and drinks. Like it's almost like going to Japan in the heart of London. And that was my mm. sort of pitch Sponsored to them. Sponsored by Picari Sweat. <laughs> Picari <laughs> Sweat for everyone. Family Mart chicken <laughs> in every yeah. hand. It, you know, it's getting better by the minute. You know. Who knows? <laughs> we'll see what happens next year. But uh, my enthusiasm... Let's do an Edinburgh show. Yeah. Outside in the outside in the streets, trying to get <laughs> solicited for tickets. Perfect. We'll see what happens. <laughs> We've got um, a story from Daryl from Scotland, who says, "Hello, Chris and Pete. I, <coughs> I'm sorry. I recently returned from my first trip to Japan in July 2024. One thing that immediately stood out to me was the use of UV repelling umbrellas in the scorching Ooh. heat. One night." After visiting the Tokyo Skytree, which was incredibly busy, I got caught in a sudden downpour outside a subway station near my hotel. I waited for the rain to stop, and after 20 minutes, it just kept pouring. Just as I was about to run for it, an elderly Japanese man handed me a clear umbrella without a word and disappeared back into the station. A few days later in Kyoto, I met up with my partner's family, and we went to see the King Kakuji Temple, but it was closed. As we tried to catch a glimpse from the outskirts, a storm approached. An elderly man on a bike stopped us and repeatedly said, Stop! pointing up at the road. Uh, despite the confusion, he eventually led us to his house, where he brought out four clear umbrellas, one for each of us. I started noticing these clear umbrellas outside convenience stores with no price tags, which got me wondering about their significance. Are they free to take when it rains? <laughs> Should they be returned to a store afterwards? <laughs> Are they shared amongst the community? I'd love to know more <laughs> about Japan's umbrella etiquette for my next visit. Daryl from Scotland. The bit there about the umbrellas at the front of stores, Daryl, they're just people's umbrellas. That's a umbrella holder for when you walk <laughs> into the store. Let's not be an umbrella thief. In my most recent <laughs> video before the bar, I talked about how the greatest theft in Japan is just umbrella theft. and yeah, uh, constant yeah. umbrella theft. I got nicked the other day. But, uh, yeah, I mean, are they kind of... Are they, are they, do they protect you from... I mean, I guess they do because they're quite thick plastic, but do they... Um, but check you from uh, UV. I'm always sort of wondering: mm. Can you get a sun tan? Can you get harmful rays through a window? Uh, yeah, you can. Sort of, can you? Through a window, yeah, you can. I, yeah. uh, can you? I just, I just thought like the glass would protect you in some way. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know why those things would be particularly uh, UV repellent, but I guess they are for better or worse. Um, clear. They didn't. They don't have to be clear, I suppose. So presumably that would be. How does that work? Uh, if they're clear, they're, though. Surely, if they're clear, they're not UV repellent. They have to be. Oh, I mean, opaque. the same way that 
in the same way that um, you, the old uh, the, the old uh, sunglasses are. I've got to get. Um, mm. I've, I've got some uh, new glasses in my life, Chris. Uh, speaking of UV um, stuff, um, I've got to get my next sunglasses. My next um, prescription sunglasses are going to be very focals because I'm the <laughs> oldest man alive. <laughs> I've got to have. A business in the front, party in the back. Oh my awful, god! Awful, awful situation. Gutted, absolutely gutted. Poor old Pete. Well, <laughs> poor well, old Pete. Don't worry, Pete. Next time I come back from Japan, I'll bring you a UV repellent umbrella. That'll cheer you up. Thank you, it? darling. That'll yeah. cheer you up. Brilliant. Um, yes, please. <laughs> but can UV repellent umbrellas protect you from the wrath of God? That's a segue there to a story. It's a, yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, can it? Can it? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we'll find out the answer in this story. Survey finds <laughs> out that Japan uh, is the least God-fearing nation in the world by a long margin, actually, mm. uh, which doesn't surprise me at all because obviously in Japan we have uh, Buddhism and Shintoism, uh, which is a very mm. different belief system and one that I think is pretty damn good actually, which we'll get into in a bit. Mm. But anyway, Pete, fill us in on Japan being not so much a God-fearing nation. Yeah, the old uh, research firm Ipsos. Um, f- I don't know who funded this uh, particular study, but I mean, who who the hell? Cares? I met the man that, owned, um, <laughs> that started Ipsos. Actually, um, really, he, to, he was the Mr. chancellor. Dr. Ipsos. He was, his name was Sir Robert Worcester, and he was uh, an American Ooh. man, an American entrepreneur, and he was very powerful. Uh, and he was also the chancellor of the University of Kent when I was there. And I got given an yeah. award, and he gave me the award. And he lives in a castle. And he made a lot. He's the big daddy of big data. There's a lot of money in in polls, apparently. Um, yeah. yeah, definitely. Carry on. Just, mate. just uh, even on the politics side, uh, the city demands answers. Uh, the International Religion Survey of 2023, compiled by Ipsos, uh, asked people in 26 major countries whether they believed in a deity in the Judeo-Christian Islamic sense. Um, I uh, believe <laughs> in the uh, God of Coolish. Uh, the global average <laughs> of believers was 40, percent but in Japan, only three percent of Jesus. people claimed to be believers. More broadly though when asked religious practices are an important factor in the moral life of my country's citizens only 25% of Japanese respondents agreed one of the lowest levels in the survey furthermore only 20% of Japanese respondents agreed with the statement people with a religious faith are better citizens Um, obviously like you say um, Japan does have Buddhism and Shinto uh, the prevalent religions uh, but they are a little bit more abstract a little bit more flexible and maybe you are into the beliefs of Buddhism and Shinto but maybe you don't have that sort of title. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. a, a, a moral, um, a moral compass doesn't compass doesn't have to be a uh, religious one. But uh, yeah, thirty five percent of Japanese respondents said that they believed in supernatural spirits such as angels, demons, fairies, ghosts, etc. Um, so yeah, they, they, apparently they they they're not into the Abrahamic religions, but they do mark Christmas and Easter alongside eating a lot of delicious foods. <laughs> <laughs> I will say. I am. Uh, I've got. Yeah, I really like Shintoism and Buddhism. To be fair, um, mm. also rewind a little bit. They don't believe in Jesus or God or whatever, and yet Jesus is buried in Japan. Don't forget in Aomori. Yes, he has his grave he found there, him, or he died <laughs> age one hundred and twenty after his brother. Yeah. And this is written on the you know the tablet at the cross in Aomori. Yeah, his brother took yeah. his place on the cross, didn't he? Um, and then he travelled from Jerusalem. Uh, from from all the way to Japan and lived out his final <laughs> days in Aomori. Good video, yeah, that. Just hanging out. Video. Um, hanging out. Also, the, but there is also, Japan does have cults as well. So I think in the absence of any firm belief to cling to, cults do run amok here a little bit. Um, you know, there's 2,000 cults operating in Japan and some of them are very kind of concerning as well. Um, so there's that. But no, I, I really like Shintoism. I remember Ryotaro telling me once, I, I remember asking, like, why is Japan so clean and people respectful to things around them? And he sort of said, uh, when you have, you know, you tell your kids, if your kid's being a bit silly and hitting things, like kicking the table, the parents will be like, don't hit table, San. And they'll treat, like, all the <laughs> objects around you like there's some sort of god almost within it or some sort of life force inhabiting it almost like the mm. force from star wars i wonder where george lucas pinched that from but um yeah there's a there's a there's sort of a, a life force that runs through everything and there's different gods for different things and different objects and items right so rather than being one all-powerful god there are many many gods and it gets really interesting when it goes into the realms of the uh you know supernatural because um as we see 35 percent here people here do believe believe in 
angels, demons, fairies, ghosts. Often, though, spiritual beings in Japan are seen in a positive light. They're not seen as, like, overly menacing. They're usually mm. seen quite positively. Um, but, yeah, I mean, what do you make of it all? Have you, how have you, what's your interaction with Shintoism and Buddhism been over the years? Never sort of run into it, I suppose. It's one of those kind of, um, I, I think, us in the West, I think we kind of like um, ally those religions with um, sort of healing and, you know, new age kind of, I'm not going to say charlatans, but I think um, the sort of people who co-opt uh, these religions in the West can sometimes be, um, a, you know, sometimes asking for money or attention. Mm. And it just seems, I just I just always think that, uh, although I've, I've not run into, um, you know, um, what the belief system sort of stands for, um, I just sort of think that you, um, I, I do sort of think that it's kind of fitted into like the health space quite tidily. And it shouldn't do, because that's not what that's about. But yeah, it's, uh, mm, mm. that's what I think anyway. I mean, I, I just, it's really nice how many kind of temples and shrines you find throughout Japan. There's tens of thousands mm. everywhere, right? Every little farm seems to have like a nice little shrine there to protect the yeah. and sort of wish for good fortune. So there is definitely a strong belief in something more than this life, this world. Some interesting points here about Shintoism. Um, number one, there's they have a reverence for nature. Shintoism worships natural spirits, kami, found in everything from trees to rivers. Number two, purity focus. Rituals emphasize cleanliness and purification to connect with the divine. So of course, when you visit a shrine or a temple, you often wash your hands, right? In those beautiful little fountains. Um, yeah. Number three, shrine worship. Central to Shinto practices are shrines where offerings and prayers are made. I love finding these little shrines in the countryside and there's just like a one cup sake that's stuck on the shrine. <laughs> yeah, <popped> on, yeah. <laughs> Like just a packet of crisps, you know, that's been uh, lovingly left there. Or like in the stories, uh, the story about three podcasts ago, some people having sex up against it. <laughs> yeah, let's don't do that. Um, number four, festive culture. Shintoism um, celebrate is celebrated through vibrant festivals, Matsuri, honouring mm. kami and seasons. Yes, there's lots of festivals around the country, and Shintoism's heavily tied with that. It's all about showing kind of appreciation. And number five, there's no dogma. Yeah. Shintoism has no sacred texts or very strict doctrines. It's all about rituals and community. So... I think Shintoism's um, bloody awesome. And I'd like to dig a bit deeper into it because I feel like yeah. 12 years I've been here, I've got a fundamental appreciation for it, but I don't know a great deal about it. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons Japan is so damn good. And even though people might not adhere to any strict doctrine, you know, it's definitely there subconsciously in the minds of most of the Japanese population, I think. you know. Um, but definitely a topic to dig into a bit deeper, I think. Uh, I think yeah. it's, it's well, fascinating. It, it sounds stuff. it sounds very much like it's um, because of its fluidity, because of its um, flexibility, because of its uh, you know it's, it's it, again there's no central uh, text necessarily. It's kind of um, it's harder to get a hold of if you know what I mean. It's harder to package up into one thing. Mm, uh, mm. As I said, the, the the way that we sort of experience it out in the West is is literally just. Um, uh, people just just kind of reselling kind of health health um, plans and stuff. Yeah. Um, in in my opinion, anyway. So it I, it must be quite hard to kind Icky of get, get handle on exactly what it is. Yeah, all our business. Icky guy. All our business. What's your purpose? Well, there's uh, there's loads of like quotes that are just made up lies. I saw one on yeah. Twitter or X or the fuck it's called the other day. Uh, mm. My friend Marcus reposted. Um, let me find it. And they always do. This. Here we go. There's a quote, and it says. There's a Japanese legend that says, if you feel like you're losing everything, remember, trees lose their leaves every year, yet they still stand tall and wait for better years to come. Nobody fucking said that in Japan. That's just a made-up <laughs> piece of shit. It's also a very shit quote. Why, why would you compare yourself to a tree losing leaves? It's just... It's just Oh, stop comparing yourself to a tree losing leaves. And I For said, uh, well, there's an ancient Japanese proverb. If you miss a train on the Yamanote line, the next train is only <laughs> a four minute wait. Opportunities await those who are patient in life. Like, it's just <laughs> ridiculous how uh, you know, self help guides are poaching j elements of Japanese culture and sort of spinning it and twisting it into some weird Western yeah. bullshit means of making money and it kind of drives me up the wall a little bit. Yeah. Uh, could Absolutely be a good video though. Could be a good little documentary to make in the not too distant future. We'll be back in just a moment guys with the stories, comments and questions over in the fax machine. Wow. Now we're back with the fax machine. What have we got this week from our listeners, Mr. Dawson? Fill us in. 
we got a wonderful, um, possibly Dutch-themed um, name, uh, Jeremy Van Parson in Libertyville, Illinois. Uh, hi, Chris and Pete. In late September, I'll be in Tokyo for four days. After four trips to Japan, visiting the far north and the far south, I'm finally going to actually explore Tokyo. That's all, that's an interesting like uh, order of things, isn't it? I've already ha- got places that I must visit, like vintage toy shops in Nakano, Broadway, several shrines and temples, a couple of museums in, in Mount Takao. Um, my question is, can you recommend any udon restaurants? Restaurants. Ramen seems to get all the attention, and while I love a good bowl of ramen, I really love udon. Thanks for everything you guys do with the pod, udon monster, Jeremy Van Passen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a good good idea, actually. I think udon is often overlooked. Um, there's a really cool Agree. chain, and it is a chain, um, called Marugame Seimen. Um, which sound, mm. sounds a bit sketchy. If I can see Pete <laughs> Dawson fucking up the pronunciation of that one, Marugame <laughs> Seiman, and uh, it's a really good chain. And you sort of you go in, and most udon restaurants, um, you go in and get your bowl of udon. You choose what kind of type of udon udon you want first, hot yep. or cold or thick or thin, and then you get your toppings. You go through and you get like little tongs and you put your tempura on you. You put all your vegetables on and um yeah it's a really good chain but the udon is so damn decent it's so hearty and filling the reason i don't eat udon that often though is it's a carb like bomb i i eat it yeah. and then my blood sugar gets like screwed through the roof and i <laughs> <laughs> just knocks me out but uh yeah, yeah marugami salmon's a good one can't i can't recommend it enough and there's a few other udon chains but yeah i don't know a good udon straight up restaurant in Tokyo, unfortunately, so I can't help you on that front. Uh, we got mm. one here from David. He says, Hi, Chris and Pete. I'm visiting Japan this November. I was wondering, aside from snow monkeys sitting in hot springs, bowing deer in Nara, and strange creatures in Tokyo cafes, what's the most interesting wildlife you've seen in Japan? I'd like to see the giant salamander one day, or maybe raccoon dogs. Do you have any amazing creatures you'd like to see? Yours kindly, David from California. Pete, what animals have you seen in Japan? Uh, I saw some um, rabbits on Rabbit Island. I saw oh, some yeah. foxes in the fox um, village that you, you showed me. Um, I've seen tiny little pigs uh, in a pig cafe. I've seen penguins in a bar. I've seen... Um, <laughs> ooh, uh, have I seen some hedgehogs? I think I might have been to a hedgehog and an owl cafe and all that good stuff. Loads of dogs. Excellent dogs kicking kicking around. Um yeah, I've seen quite quite the menagerie. I've never, I've not seen like big animals or anything. Did I go to a, no? That might have been Taiwan. I went to a zoo in Taiwan uh, that wasn't wasn't amazing, uh, let's say. But uh, yeah, I I, th- I think I've seen a quite quite a collection. Never se- not seen a lot of seafaring uh, folk uh, that haven't been on my plate. But um, <laughs> it, but yeah, I've, I've I've seen I've seen enough for animals. I think and a big bear who lives oh my God. in Kyushu. I uh, saw so a big bear, and he is the mascot of one of their cities. <laughs> oh, yeah, Kumamon. 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 Yeah. I d- I'd recommend going... To, I really want to go to Rabbit Island again, actually, just for that surreal... Mm. Uh, that moment where you get off the boat, and there's the sign that's like, left, rabbits, right, chemical weapons facility. It's like, <laughs> There's a film waiting to be made on this island. Yeah, get a Rabbit Island, yeah. seal the rabbits. Or uh, a really bad pie. <laughs> oh god we got one last question from Andy he says uh, hello Chris and Pete have either of you or will either of you consider buying your own property in Japan and if so what locations appeal to you and why I'd love to find somewhere near Furuno in Hokkaido or Asahikawa so that I can set up a rental accommodation and snow related business cheers Andy from Melbourne Australia um, that's a really good place actually yeah really cool place to buy a property and renovate it um Furano in particular has a lot of places where you can rent them like a Airbnb style place. Um, right. It's the place with the rolling fields in Hokkaido and then near some ski resorts oh, in winter. Oh yes, okay. Yes, yes. Very yes, heavy yes, snowfall. I I don't know. I mean Charlotte's got two places that she's renovated in Tokyo and rents out and she's done an amazing job. It's really inspiring seeing what the places look like before and after, particularly the second one. Yeah. Um yeah. really damn cool. I I don't know if I'll do that. I'm not that big on property. I like, you know, home is where I hang my hat. I like to move around a fair bit. I um mm. but I'm not ruling out potentially getting a place in Yamagata one day. My spiritual Japanese home, shall we say. And there are so many empty houses in Tohoku, unfortunately. And uh because I kind of see that as my home in some respects, you know, a place where I 
feel I fit in or feel like I mm. yeah, I feel like a I don't know, a spiritual belonging, like Shintoism. To to Tohoku. I think if I was gonna buy somewhere it would be in Yamagata, to be honest. What mm. about yourself, Pete? Where would you go? Probably Shibuya, isn't it? Well, I, 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 I mean, I just I just watched a, a video um, with a man called Chris Broad saying that you shouldn't buy uh, property, cheap property in Japan because um, you know the taxes and the you know you spend a lot well, of money yeah, to do yeah, them yeah, up and, and the and the rural Japan is no one's around, so there's nothing to do. It's I've true. been told not to do that, so you see. But I mean, I did stay in a lovely um, old house in um, in uh, at the foot of Mount Aso um, oh, cool. in August. And it was like this sprawling uh, old kind of Japanese house. And uh, there's something, I sort of look back at that and I sort of go, that was a lovely three or four days. And if I could have a house like that, Ooh. just in the middle of nowhere, I'll write my book. And in, then, <laughs> and in then the cold burn era. the whole thing down. <laughs> in the cold <laughs> era of the most powerful <sighs> earthquake, and most powerful yeah. volcano, sorry, in all of Asia. Bring it Pete on. Pete Donaldson wants on. a house. What could yeah. possibly go wrong? <laughs> My God, uh, if, that, it on. if the Aso Caldera ever erupted, half of Kyushu would go with it, unfortunately. Should be okay, though. I think it's been 200,000 years since the last one. Um, right. Touch wood. But yeah, I. <laughs> it, it, well, in the video, I, di- I didn't want to put people off. I just wanted to say that there's a lot of social media stuff around cheap houses in Japan, right? But if you dig yep. into those places, and they are, they, the photos look good, the price looks appealing. If you go, where mm. is this? Oh, it's in a field 25 kilometers from the nearest shop. I'm not sure I want to go there. And that is a, yeah, we need to go a bit deeper onto that when you look at those social media posts because they're, yeah. they're, they're selling an idealistic house, but really the, the reality is a lot less fun than it would appear, I think. But uh, yeah. I, I, I'm tempted to buy somewhere in the Abigata one day if the price is right and the price is low keep the stories questions comments <laughs> coming in to Broad Japan Podcast at gmail.com we'll be back later in the week guys to do it all over again but for now have yourself a great few days we'll see you right back here to do it all over again on the Broad Japan Podcast bye for now have a good one I'm turning up with me hammer bang 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 me bang, and bang, bang. cigarettes on the go cigarettes whiskey away. in the races beautiful <laughs> <laughs> what a weekend <laughs>